Uh, everybody, welcome to uh, my talk about uh, Tsugi. My glamorous assistant, Ian Dolphin, is handing out brochures. Uh, the reason that I'm, th oh, and my other glamorous assistant, my glamorous board member assistant is handing out brochures. Um, the reason I made these brochures is that I have gotten feedback that every talk I give about Tsugi confuses the audience more than it elucidates it. So this, so what you do is you read this after you're done listening to me, you'll say, I had no idea what he just said, but then this is what I really meant to say is in this brochure. So the title of my talk is Building the Next Generation Digital Learning Environment. I follow on uh, uh, <clears throat> from Malcolm. Uh, gave a great talk. Uh, Malcolm sort of fired this thing off, and you know I think the world was going in the right direction. The question I was going to ask Malcolm, because they did a retreat to figure out the whole NGDLE thing, I was going to ask Malcolm, what was the second best idea that they came up with, the one that sort of didn't make it out of committee? Um, and so I'll just ask him that a little bit later. Uh, tsugi is the Japanese word for next, homage to Steve Jobs, and uh, koseyu is the Korean word for course. Um, the way I name projects is I have a concept and I just sit in Google Translate and a DNS lookup and I look for five letter words that are translated into something and then I, if the domain name is available then I start that as the name of my project and I just keep going. I'll be Swahili or something. I got a bunch of stickers up here. If you took my Python class, I have a Python sticker. If you took my internet history class, I have an internet history sticker. I have a Sugi sticker and I have a very limited supply of Sakai Girl stickers because I just keep running out. They're up here, so at the end you can come and get these. Does anybody in the room actually have Sugi in production where users are using it? Because what I've done for those who put Sugi in production is I've made a limited edition Swiss Army knife for Sugi. Now you gotta send it because you can't take it through airport security. But I got, I'm sending like three of them because we have Sugi in production. Okay, oh, I grabbed the wrong clicker, but that's okay because I have the right clicker in the other pocket. Okay, so we in this building uh, built an enterprise learning management system, been there, done that, got the tattoo, wrote a book about it even. This is the, uh, the, my Amazon royalties for last year. I sold a, I sold a total of 6,500 books. If you look at the very bottom, you can see how many Sakai books I sold in fiscal year 2016 two Sakai books. People, the Korean translation of my Python book sold far more copies than, uh, than my uh, Sakai book. I know, and it's also free, so why would you really have to buy it, right? So you just, you just go download it and read it for the 18 people that probably read it. But all those other books are also free, so uh, you don't have to pay for those either. So, um, so to review... The idea is, is this LMS was this monolithic thing. You know, we sort of walk in as faculty and students like the apes in Space Odyssey and, and sort of worship this thing, and it is the center of our universe. And the problem with it is that one, it's a one-size-fits-all solution where, you know, no matter who you are or what you teach, whether you're a computer science teacher or a humanities teacher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're stuck with that. And one of the things that I learned after we finished Sakai and I thought that I would have built the greatest thing humans ever would have seen by having open source LMS, what I learned was is that LMSs were walled gardens, even open source LMSs are walled gardens. And all we did was created an open source uh, walled garden. So in 2007, 2008, I vowed that I would create the world's greatest escape hatch from learning management systems, and that's called learning tools interoperability. It's how we faculty can get out of learning management systems without seeming to get out of learning management systems. So IMS came out in 2010, Common Cartridge came out in 2008. These were the, the great escape patches for learning management systems. And uh, the tattoo on my shoulder is called the IMS Learning Tools Interoperability Ring of Compliance. Uh, IMS LTI was no a fait accompli. Uh, it was something that I was very worried about. I knew that the LMS vendors, the, the mainstream ones, we were only represented 5% and Sakai had it right away, but that doesn't matter if the rest of the market doesn't want to do it. And so I challenged the CEOs of all of the LMSs in the market at the time that I would put tattoo their logo on my shoulder if they passed LTI 1.0 compliance. And so here we have uh, Desire to Learn, Blackboard, and with great pomp and circumstance, I would put them on one at a time, as each one did. And the most recent one is Coursera. I actually helped put the LTI into Coursera. 
And as soon as I made this challenge with my tattoo, I think this is really the cause, the certifications went up uh, dramatically. And I haven't put all of the certifications on as tattoos. I, they had to have a certain market share to get certified. So now what we have is like hundreds, 400, 500 LTI tools. I am really, 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 really tired of LTI tools, okay? Everybody, everybody builds LTI tools, and I mentored many of those companies to build LTI tools, and I gave them the software that they use to adapt to build LTI implementations. Pardon my whatever. And so I have had enough of bad LTI implementations. This to me is one of the rate limiting usability and student experience is one of the rate limiting factors of getting to what Malcolm talked about this morning. Sorry, I mean, could we cut all the swear words out of the, of the online thing? Damn it. hate it when that happens. Bleep, bleep, bleep. Okay, so, um, so these two standards were really, really simple. Uh-oh, is Twitter going? Oh, I see. <laughs> Quit swearing. Um, okay, so... Two standards kind of revolutionized the industry, but IMS has not been sitting on its hands. We mentioned in the last talk about one roster. There are literally 10 really good standards coming out in the next couple of years. We're working on standards for Turnitin and all these things. There's all kind of really good work doing. Here's the difference. LTI was about four pages of text. These standards themselves are somewhere between 20 and 150 pages. These standards are not easy because they're solving much harder problems that LTI did than LTI solved. I don't know how we're going to educate all the developers on the planet on how to build every single one of these standards. And so these new standards themselves are like an earthquake waiting to happen. Like these standards exist already. People don't even know. Pat asked the question in the last session blah 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 and it's like one roster you didn't even know and it's actually sort of exploding and that's because so many things have happened in the last couple of years because of the belief that LTI was a good idea and so this is not necessarily something that's going to make it better because the only people that can take advantage of this are the billion dollar corporations that can send four or five engineers to go read all these standards so you might think this is a great thing but I see it as a dangerous thing now there's a standard that you may not have heard about that is probably the most historically significant standard in ed tech ever. LTI and common cartridge were all created sort of because of Sakai in 2003, 2004, 2005. We, we incubated those ideas, IMS standardized those ideas, and they were the first grossly shaped escape hatches. But what's happened since then and all these other standards, of those standards, the one that's by far the most important is a standard called IMS Content Item. So IMS Content Item actually connects learning tools interoperability. It's sort of halfway between LTI 1 and LTI 2, and it's actually a really easy standard to implement, unlike most of those other standards that I showed you. And all it does is it outsources the notion of choosing an LTI tool or a resource and then sending that resource back into the learning management system. It fills the gaps between LTI and, com and common cartridge in a beautiful way that's simple and elegant, and it becomes kind of the third leg on the stool of standards. For the first time in all of recorded history, using nothing but a relatively simple and easy to understand set of standards, you can build an app store for education or a learning object repository and integrate it literally into every major learning management system on the planet using only standards. And I mean not a single proprietary extension is required. Content item is now supported by Sakai, it's supported by Moodle, it's supported by desire to learn and it's supported by its original inventor, Canvas. The only LMS that doesn't support this is Blackboard. Blackboard didn't get the memo early enough because they kind of weren't coming to meetings enough. And so they went and built LTI 2 because if LTI 1 is good, then LTI 2 must be gooder, right? And so, but they realized that content item is the money shot for the next round of standards. I can't take credit for this. We can take credit for LTI and we can take credit for common cartridge, although Sakai kind of invented common cartridge and caused it to go into be formed. 
we re, our, our community kind of was not leading that. We certainly led LTI. Um, common cartridge, I got to acknowledge, there's probably five people in the world who are the greatest common cartridge experts in the, uh, in the world, and, and one of them is a former Blackboard employee called Bracken Mossbacker, and uh, he's, he is one of the five people that made common cartridge useful. He made it useful because he was one employee number five of Canvas, and they decided to use common cartridge and LTI as core to their architecture, and so they had to hack them both fiercely. And so they hacked Common Cartridge, and what Bracken did was figured out how to build far richer information in a cartridge that was still a legal and legitimate cartridge, but could actually represent the entire import and export process. So Bracken had to extend Common Cartridge, and he kind of he, he widened it a little bit and then ran a whole truck through. So uh, Canvas's exports are a variation of Common Cartridge, but that also changed for a good now, a content item also came from a former Canvas employee, employee number two of Canvas, and that's Brian Whitmer. So Brian Whitmer is employee number two. He was the LTI expert inside Canvas. Neither Bracken, Bracken now works for Lumen Learning, and Brian just has a little startup helping with some medical portable application or something like that and enjoying life a lot because he was founder number two. And so, uh, so Brian is the kind of the creator of the content item spec. Uh, what you see there on the right-hand side is uh, Brian Whitmer's uh, Halloween costume from a few years back. Uh, Brian Whitmer win as me for his Halloween costume. And uh, of course, he's much younger, uh, more handsome, and in much better shape, but he did have a approximate tattoo that looked a lot like me. And so, to me, these are the three standards that make the next generation digital learning environment possible. And uh, so, NGDLE comes out a couple of years ago. To me, it was just like a marriage made in heaven. The notion, NGDLE is kind of like this high-level idea, and it's, we got these standards that are ready to go. So it seems like perfect, right? But then we ask ourselves, what would the NGDLE look like? I would say one way the NGDLE, we would know that we've seen the NGDLE is if we see a million applications in the educational app store, all from independent vendors. Is that possible? There are app stores. Canvas's EduApp Center is kind of wretched. Edmodo has a proprietary app store. MindTap is itself an app store. They're all pretty bad, right? Canvas Commons, Blackboard's Explore, they're all pretty wretched actually. So we don't, and none of them really empower independent developers in the way that I think Apple or Google Play empowers independent developers. So we got a lot of work to do because ultimately instead of a monolith we're going to have tons and tons of little tiny snowflakes that somehow will all be as beautiful and distinct and different but yet have some kind of unifying shape, right? We can't just let everybody build every single tool from scratch using uh, if we have a thousand tool writers, we don't need a thousand UX designers to make them all different. We need some consistency, but then some diversity. So we need a th tens of thousands of beautiful learning applications that are easy to write and yet consistent enough so that the users can make use of them and not feel uh, cognitive dissonance when they f flip from one application to another. So we have all these standards that are coming out. We need to train thousands of developers on how to do that, and the standards are way more complex than common cartridge and content item. And so is this impossible? I mean, is it not possible at all to do the next generation digital learning environment? And the answer is, think back to when everybody wrote blog code by themselves, and then WordPress came. And now it's easy to do WordPress. You just say, oh, I want to do a blog, I'll get WordPress. Maybe I'll get hosting from WordPress.org. Okay, it's expandable, there's plugins, there's all kinds of an ecosystem around WordPress. So what we need is we need WordPress for education, like an edupress. Unfortunately, this domain name is taken, otherwise I would all have it. So what's WordPress? What's the edupress for education? And that is, it's a learning management system of my own. Not an enterprise learning management system, but my own personal one. An open education resource site of my own. A learning object repository of my own a learning record store of my own so that I can construct whatever beautiful things that I want to construct. Millions of sites, millions of courses, all similar and yet sharing similar, all, sim all, all distinct but yet sharing similar underlying architecture. Seems impossible. So what is Sugi and Koseyu and how does it relate to this vision? Well, 
Sugi and Koseyu intend to empower every single instructional designer, every single faculty member, every single IT organization to take absolute control over the end user experience of their teachers and their learners. It's a framework for building interoperable tools and content. It's so complex that it had to have two names. I used to have a name called Sugi and I kept throwing more things into it and people like, Sugi freaks me out because it has so many things. So I said, I'll call half of it Sugi and half of it Koseyu. So now I have a thing called Koseyu and a thing called Sugi and I've changed my little brochure to have like a Koseyu column and a Sugi column. I didn't actually change the text. It used to just be the Sugi two columns, but now it's Koseyu and Sugi. Sugi is the app store for education. It's the enabling technology that allows for an app store for education. It has a series of API libraries in PHP, Python, Node, etc., that implements all those nasty standards. Literally, you write a bit of code, you can write Hello World, and you can certify Hello World for LTI 1011, content item, LTI 2, soon LTI 2.1, etc., 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 and you just wrote Hello World. But you can still plug that into all these LMSs using my libraries, right? It has a hosting and management component. It's a container for stores with a design so that either a commercial company could start up a store and host applications or a school could start up. I'm a big thing of, of privacy. I don't want, I don't like cloud hosted global learning management system companies. They just make me want to wretch because of the privacy aspects of that. That somehow every bit of data in order to have a convenient pretty user experience, we got to put all the data in the hands of a US based company. I just find that reprehensible and that's why I'm here. But we also need to train these developers. So if I'm going to have a 1,000 developers building applications in a couple of years, there has to be a training mechanism for them. Because if you go work in Apple, they will tell you how to write your application. Sugi, App Store. Second half, Koseyu is EduPress. It's a course publishing site. I claim it is the world's smallest learning management system because it only requires about 50 lines of code to fully implement a learning management system. You add a learning management system to an existing website by adding a .ht access file and a single file that routes it, and then there's a whole bunch of dynamically loaded classes sitting in the background in your vendor folder, and you actually have a learning management system. It's called Koseyu. It also is an open education resource hosting site. So you don't even have to, Koseyu is designed to give all of its resources away free. We'll change this if people want to do it. But it's designed to make it so you can have OER searchable stuff, you can Google you know, how to install Python, and you might come to a lesson deep within one of my websites because it's just Google searchable. So course material, or at least kind of this non-instructor faceted course material, stole your word, non-instructor, Lucy, I stole it, non-instructor faceted, the global sort of what's a super course, I kind of call that a super course that instructors can facet into their own course. That is OER materials that's searchable by Google and visible by Google. It is a standalone MOOC hosting platform that's easily able, with moderate hosting requirements, to handle a million users. And the reason it can handle a million users is because every course gets its own database. And that's a very different model than the learning management systems, where if you think about it, a million enrollments is nothing to a learning management system. And a Koseyu site has a million enrollments with a million students, whereas the way you get a million enrollments in somewhere like a uh, university is you just wait 10 years and eventually you have a million enrollments. So these data models scale fine to a million. They don't scale to hundreds of millions, but they scale to a million. A lot of the MOOC platforms, the way they work is they give a database not just for every course, but sometimes for every section of every course has its own database. And so the data models actually scale beautifully to the size of a section of a course. And then in Amazon, they just kind of keep whoosh, whoosh them out, right? Because they don't put up new servers, they just kind of hide them in Amazon. And, and, and the, the course from 10 years ago is just sitting there as a database that's not being accessed. And it's also a standalone learning object repository that can be easily in it, integrated into learning management systems using content item. This is how my life is. So I used to, in 2012, I used to put all my stuff in Sakai. Um, my, cam my campus went to Canvas, and I vowed that I would spend as little time in that piece of software as I possibly could. And so what I did is I built my entire own learning management system and learning object repository that I host separately outside at pythonforeverybody.com, www.py4e.com. I also publish a book, the one you saw that I sell 6,000 copies of, Python for Everybody. And I decided that for my own teaching, now I'm a little nerdier than the average person, my own teaching is all in GitHub. 
when I am preparing for class, writing assignments, writing lecture notes, etc., I edit files, whether they're Markdown or HTML or Word docs or PowerPoints, and I stick them in GitHub. And then I have a production website that pulls from that GitHub every 30 minutes and puts that stuff up on the internet. I also have a whole book publishing workflow and a whole media publishing workflow that allows me to multi-publish all this stuff. I keep building gadgetry to make this easier and easier. I understand that my publishing workflow is a little harder than most faculty would tolerate, but it's not that hard to build a good user interface once you have a good publishing workflow. So the use cases I see for these products are like campus IT staff. They should be putting up app stores. Notre Dame has a little one, et cetera. Instructional designers, I want them to become lightweight programmers to build pedagogically on target applications. Faculty, they can build their learning content once and instead of like copying it inside the learning management system, build it outside the learning management and repeatedly import it. Then you can import it not into just into Canvas or you put it in Sakai, Blackboard, et cetera, et cetera. I put the exact same content in Coursera, inside Canvas, inside Sakai, and I'm sneaking up a CanvasNet version of this same course, and it took me an hour to put my entire course on CanvasNet because I have single-click import into Canvas. Boom, doom, hey, review my class. Literally, that's how fast I can put a course into Canvas. Book authors, I'm a book author, so I am competing with Pearson, right? Pearson sells you a book, sells you my, Pearson's My Math Lab, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do the same damn thing. I am going to out Pearson Pearson. And that's the reason open education resources, in my opinion, have been a complete and total failure, except they're getting better now, is because we keep thinking that open education resources are books. If open educational resources are books plus, 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 and we actually then, by actually adding a free MOOC on top of all that, we create a learning community around our book, and I'm actually better than Pearson at that point, right? I am trying to put Pearson's Python publishing out of business. Turns out Pearson's Python book was written my, by my thesis advisor, who I play hockey with four times a week, and I tease the crap out of him. How many? I ask him how books he sells. I'm selling more books than he is, and his book costs a hundred dollars, and he gets two dollars a book. My book costs nine dollars, and I get two dollars a book. So I tease him mercilessly, right? So when I put him right out of business. Other use cases: OER publishers, so Lumens of the world, the OpenStax of the world, MOOC platform. MOOCs are not a very democ democratic environment because you have to be a fancy school like the University of Michigan and then you gotta kiss the butt of Coursera and then the faculty have to kiss the butt of the people on campus to get into Coursera. I've done all that. You're welcome to have a sticker from my class if you've taken it. I'm really fortunate, but I don't believe that that should be the only way to get a MOOC out. I think every faculty member should download Koseyu and make their own damn MOOC, register a domain of their own and make their own MOOC and, and go that way. EdTech startups, <laughs> I've already had my first, that just grabs my stuff, makes a tool, starts making money. They don't have to worry about standards integration. LMS vendors, what I really want to do is go to every LMS talk, every LMS conference in the summer and give a Sugi workshop. And I, I almost got Blackboard to bite this time, to say, just bring Chuck in to give a Sugi workshop. And I still might do it. I mean, I still might be invited to Blackboard's BB World to talk about Sugi. I'd like Canvas people here, I'd like Blackboard people here, I'd like the whole market to be here to learn how to build stuff to plug into their LMSs because I can plug in into any of them and I don't care. So a big thing about this is training. So I'm a MOOC guy. And so I dream of creating thousands of developers and the only way to create thousands of developers is not for me to personally travel to their offices and teach them. And so I've built two online websites that if you start with nothing but basic programming skill, oh, and by the way, I have a, program, a website for programming skill. If you take my MOOC on Python and you learn how to program, then you take my next MOOC on Web Applications for Everybody, soon to be on Coursera as a specialization, you will learn how to do PHP and MySQL. The moment you finish that class, you are ready to go to the Sugi website, which itself is a MOOC that trains you on how to write Sugi applications. I don't get to talk to most of the people who write Sugi applications. They're on my dev list, and when I break the trunk, then I get email from them, but they're already up and in production. So I have a whole pipeline of application training that I've already built. I'm going to use Coursera for that, create hundreds of thousands of developers. I, I don't think I can do the demo because we're, <laughs> we're using the wrong laptop right now, um, but I will tell you what the demo would be. It's really short. I click a button inside Sakai, uh, App Store pops up, and I say, I want a course map, and you go back to Sakai, you click on the course map, and you have it. No URL, no key, no secret. You can do the same thing in Canvas, the same thing in Moodle, 
Same thing in any LMS except Blackboard. So it's, it's one of those demos where it took 15 years to get it right and it takes 15 seconds to show you and you realize that it's right when it's one click integration. No key, no secret, no nothing. So here's the project status. Part of what I'm supposed to tell you is how Tsugi is doing. So I've taken a very different approach to Tsugi's software development than we did in Sakai. Although it's very similar to how Sakai was in the very earliest of days. What I do is I upgrade to production eight to ten times. I upgrade production eight to ten times a week. I basically have a number of sites in production that are supporting my Coursera courses that as soon as I check code into the trunk, within 30 minutes a cron job runs at the top of every hour that pulls that out and immediately puts it into production. So I'm using 1.2 million Coursera students as my QA test. And this thing has functionality tests, it has unit tests, and it sends me email when crap goes wrong. So as soon as something goes wrong, and I could, I mean, I could show you, right? I could break it, and we could just see how long it's going to take for an email to show up on this phone when production breaks. So, um, and, and so even my, well, I'll talk about releases in a second. I've got Coursera. I use it in production in my on-campus classes. A company called School City is using it in production. There's another crazy faculty member at Indiana University of Pennsylvania called uh, Carl LeBlond, who's uh, building an open chemistry website using all of Sugi, just using Koseo and Sugi to the max. And he's kind of my first set of adopters, crazy people, right? Just crazy smart people. Uh, you'll see something in the open academic environment where we did LTI 1.0. What the interesting thing about that is we decided at that meeting that Ian showed you the picture of that we weren't going to even build a gradebook in OAE. We're going to bring the, build the gradebook in SUGI. Meaning that OAE doesn't have to have a gradebook, it just has to have a group of people. And SUGI already has a gradebook, it turns out. And the reason SUGI has a gradebook is because Coursera's gradebook back in 2012 was so crappy that I had to write my own damn LTI gradebook so the students could figure out what their grades were. So I wrote an LTI gradebook and whatever. And so, so the whole notion that, oh, wow, we can, put, we can turn something into a learning system without even writing a gradebook. Because writing a gradebook is an ugly and painful thing. It's really not what you want to do. And for OAE, it's not the thing they want to do. But so we can use OAE as in teaching and learning, we even make the gradebook be an LTI. So we've got a structure for that. The other thing that I've started to do is I go to fewer and fewer IMS meetings and I spend more and more of my travel time actually physically visiting the LMS proprietary LMS vendors. So I've been to Canvas, spent a few days there doing interoperability testing um, I, I, to make sure that both Sakai and Itsugi work the same way as Canvas does with a content item. I've been to Blackboard. I helped them certify their LTI2. The second thing that Blackboard's LTI2 talked to after they taught, passed the certification test was Sugi. Turns out that Sugi is actually easier for them to test because they can watch the logs of Sugi where they can't on the certification test. So I spent two days down at Blackboard this summer, or this a uh, couple of months ago. And um, D2L, the first piece of software outside D2L that ever used the D2L content item was Sugi. So I see Sugi as a place for me to engage the proprietary vendors. And there's various organizations that are playing with this. I don't even know who they are because they just are working on stuff. Notre Dame, Cape Town, I know them. But like Alabama, Wright State, they're Blackboard sites. I mean, how they found me, why they're, these people are using it, why they're plugging it in, I don't know. I'll find out someday. So here's the speeds and feeds. We're about three years old. We, uh, we have like lots of commits. I'm the number one committer. We have like seven people who've committed stuff to it. Um, so it's really tiny, um, but it's me. And I, you can see when I'm teaching and when it's summer vacation and when it's winter Christmas break, and you can see my coding productivity goes way up right before fall starts because I need new features to teach that fall. Um, but it's really kind of fun. I'm really enjoying it. And it's always in production, so it's pretty cool. The roadmap to where we're going next, um, I have a weird production branching mechanism. And so the way my, my production works is master is always in production. Like I said, 30 minutes after I commit to master, it's in production. What I do is if I'm about to do something that might be non-upwards compatible in master, I make a branch, what we would call in Sakai the X branch. So I'm in the middle of the zero, master is like 03X, and I'm about to do some non-upwards compatible changes for 0.4. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of make a little siding for 0.32 and say, look, if you are going to be worried about the non-upwards compatible changes I'm making in my production systems, 
then you would better switch off, get off the main line and go on your little siding for a while and then you can catch up later and it's got automatic database upgrades and all that stuff. So you just kind of like go, oh, it looks pretty good, I'll catch up, hit the database upgrade button and then poof, you're caught up to master. So the idea is to keep everybody kind of on master within a day or two and that's, uh, that's it. And so what I'm doing in 0 0.4, which is I'm gonna start in the next week or so, is I've been building Koseyu and so Sugi got too big, and so I'm cutting it in half. And on the 0 0.3 branch is still leaving the Koseyu crud inside of Sugi. And, but I built Koseyu out here. And so the 0 0.4 will be the removal of the Koseyu stuff that makes Sugi too big. And so people who are using these old URLs that are where they were when, they were, when I just threw more too much stuff in Sugi, those URLs will break. And so that's where I'm making the 0 0.4 branch. I'm also talking to the folks with Learning Registry. Learning Registry, if you recall, is a U.S. Department of Education activity to allow distributed learning objects to talk to each other and find each other through searching. And um, you may have heard that there's a CASA effort that's kind of installed at IMS, and so I'm trying to work with Learning Registry. It turns out they're still alive, even though it's a tiny group and they're talking to Gates. There's another thing that I think is being talked about here called OER schema, and these themes might seem connected, unconnected, but they actually are connected, and this is really metadata about learning objects. If I solve the problem of thousands of different learning object repositories, then I got to solve the problem of how we find the dang things, and so OER schema is a very promising thing, and I encourage you to go to the OER schema. <clears throat> That's getting me talking to Gates. I got to put some kind of learning analytics in. I just keep waiting until I have a repository to send stuff to because I'm not going to write learning analytics code until I have a learning object repository that's free or open. Um, so I mean, I don't know if it's a Bex API or Caliper. I'll probably work on that this summer. Um, another crazy thing that I'm working on is what I call a LMS PI, which is a MOOC in a box. And the idea is, is to take, because now I have all the learning content, all the auto graders, all the servers, and all the video, I'm going to make a Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to take the learning management system, the course content, etc., stick it all in a Raspberry Pi, stick a Wi-Fi plug in the Raspberry Pi, make that be a DHCP server, and make it so you can walk into a high school in rural India and drop a little tiny box this big and have a learning management system ready to go. And then all the little kids on their little phones can take the class right there, do their homework, take the class, and with no internet connection whatsoever, meaning this little Raspberry Pi will generate the internet, be the LMS, be the content server, and all they need is either laptops or computers and no connection to the outside world. Another fun application of that is I have a colleague and her uncle teaches in San Quentin. I'm like, oh, I can bring a little box into San Quentin. So because it's just PHP and it's all cheap, I can make a Raspberry Pi that is a self-contained physical learning management system and learning object repository. And I'm also working with some people I can't tell you about. Well, no, I mean, I can tell you that I'm working with people I can't tell you about, but I can't tell you the names of the companies. It's a large multinational organization. Um, and so this is, my goal in life is to enable a, a time when we have thousands of developers building tens of thousands of applications and available to all of us. So if I think back to 2004, you can see the picture that I took when I was the executive director of the Sakai Foundation. And in this picture, Sakai is trying to earn respect in a market that was already well established by Blackboard many years early. Wearing a tie, wearing a suit, acting classy. With NGDLE, there is literally no one on the planet that's within two to three years of me right now. So I'm like, I got a tattoo. I wear sunglasses. Kiss my ass and catch up, right? So the point is, is my view of the world is that because no one else knows what I know, I'm ahead. And I hope, and that's part of the reason I talk to all these vendors, I hope that for this next revolution, open source will be the leader, not the follower. Because literally Blackboard was like eight years old before we even started, before Moodle even started. We're ahead, and I'm gonna stay ahead. It's really an ongoing research project. It is my research project. Um, I'm not quite ready. I will expect to have a 1.0 release after the first of the year where I really expect people to put it in production at that point. 
Um, right now, I need really smart people who will accept the fact that there's going to be a change and maybe non upwards compatible change in trunk for a while. It's that time of this process, so it's not as finished as it might sound on my quick talk. And the other thing that's interesting is that I've been doing this for a long time, and although we've invented in these rooms some of the most amazing educational technology innovations, until this moment I never had the urge to build a company. But now, with Sugi, I cannot wait to build my first company. So I'm going to build a commercial affiliates program, a Sugi, that is respectful of, respectful of privacy, data privacy. I'm not going to build a multinational corporation. I'm going to create partner vendors that take our technology and make it work in every, every country in the world and keep that data inside that country and make it so that every school, if they want to run it, can run it and never, never leave the data. So I'm going to create a socially aware commercial partner network from the very first moment of Sugi that supports open source, supports the Peria Foundation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I hope to have that done by the first of the year. Sugi Cloud may not be the name of it. I don't have sugicloud.com. I can't get that. I just have sugicloud.org. So that's just kind of a fun placeholder. OK, so I, according to this timer, I have 1 minute and 48 seconds left. And so uh, let's get some, if you have any questions, get your hands in the air so we can get some uh, microphones to you. Uh, we got the first question up here. Uh, and uh, so, our, and uh, so now, if you have another question, get your hand in the air so we can cue them up while, while we're talking here, because you, we do have to do questions on microphones. Okay, Malcolm. So, Chuck, I was wondering if you could comment on, this came up at the previous session about the coherency problem. If oh. X of one's own is commonplace, and everyone's doing everything just a little bit differently or a lot differently, then it seems like you lose coherence for the community. So, are your comments on that? Yeah, so, the co the, so there's, there is two causes to the coherence problem, and you saw me even use swear words to talk about how bad the coherence problem is today. There are two causes for that. The first cause is lazy software developers at all of these companies. They build a thing which is really a learning management system, right, that doesn't expect a plug-in. They just want to sell to anybody who will buy their thing. They make a login button and a, and a thing, and they're going to sell their little wonderful threaded discussion thing, and then they realize, oh, wait a sec. I guess I could sell to higher ed if I plugged it in. But they've built this whole user experience, and it's just sitting there, and they have horrible data models. They're just kids that do this over and over. They go, I'll make a user table, and I'll use email as the primary key of the user table. They make all these mistakes about how to build. They don't do multi-tenancy. They don't do all the things that you would build if you were a respectable professional respectable, professional person who actually knew how to do this, right? So bad data models, bad UXs. So, that, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is there's no libraries for UX. Sugi can, has three layers of architecture. One layer is a unopinionated standards implementation. The second layer is a highly opinionated standards implementation that depends on a very rich and complex data model. Um, and the third layer is actually a UI layer. And so what I do is if you build a Sugi tool, you already have a beautiful UI. I mean, I could spend hours explaining how Sugi tools are smartly integrated, whether they're in a iframe, new window, or a window replacement. You will click on Sugi tools, and you will barely notice that you left and came back to Canvas in a couple of clicks. And so Sugi has UX patterns that are baked into its library that you, as the person who writes Hello World, don't write a single line of that. Because it, it's a combination of how the standards work and then how the standards work in real life in all the different kinds of situations that you might use in a learning management system. And there's a library for that inside Sugi. Now, you don't have to use Sugi that way if you don't want. You can use Sugi at any of the levels. And if you have a big honking piece of crap over here, you can use Sugi to kind of help you with these standards, but not with the UX. But if you're starting from scratch, which I think in a couple of years, people will come to my class, they will learn how to do Sugi tools, and they'll just build Sugi tools, because it'll be the quickest way to do it. They will inherit a gorgeous user experience automatically. They'll still just do the stuff in the middle of like, follow my friend, or whatever it is, or submit my assignment, or whatever. But all the stuff on the outside, and the interaction as you go back and forth between them, is absolutely glorious and elegant if you just follow the Sugi rules. Any other questions? Got another? Uh, let's get the microphone over there. You spoke about um, the common design elements and, yes. and UI being important to its success uh, in the App Store model. 
uh, was material design. Uh, that seems to be the best implementation of that sort of effort to date, in, in my opinion. Uh, did you take cues from that? No, I didn't do material design, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't. It turns out that what's... Um, oh, this isn't working now. I, I'm a nerd. I got a PhD in computer science. I don't have a PhD in graphic design. So I'm still stuck in the bootstrap age, right? So I'm pre-material design. Um, what, what you would notice if I could, um, what you would notice if I could, um, if I could give you a demo, which I can't. Uh, nah, none of that, none of that, none of that, none of that, none of that. What you would notice is that you could have a material design learning management system and a bootstrap thing, and the, the, the way the UX works is you end up with sort of this, you, you pop something up and it has a done button and it, done, it pops back down, right? And so it turns out that you're not, you're, you're, if you want, you're either not showing at hardly any navigation. So if you're in an iframe, the navigation hides itself. And so that whether you're using the top navigation there as material design or bootstrap, it doesn't matter. And if, so that's, that's Koseyu, but the, a, a Sugi tool, um, ha, if you come from Canvas in a new window, it just puts a nice little bar that can be colored by Canvas if it wants with a done button and then it goes back down. Or if it's in a Canvas iframe or a Sakai iframe, the Sakai and Canvas uh, Chrome. And so what happens is ultimately, yeah, Bootstrap looks a little bit different than Material, and I could then ultimately just change everything to, at some point to Material. So I'm not anti-Material, I just have Bootstrap, it's there, it's boring, and for your average set of five nerds that are going to start a startup, Bootstrap is good enough. And so I have all these conventions, and right now all that stuff is Bootstrap, and away you go. And we pre-populate the jQuery for everybody, and pre-populate some CSSs, and Koseyu, I mean, Sugi has some extensions where it can accept the navigation from the LMS and throw that up. Um, but right now, we do markup. But, you know, in two years or five years, we might find that there's a bootstrap tool and then there's a material tool. I mean, that'd be fine and that would be okay. Right now, we start and everything looks like bootstrap and it looks okay when you throw bootstrap plus material together as long as you're not having fighting navigation, right? It's the navigation is where they really stop working. And so Sugi tools are trained from the beginning to hide all their navigation except that which is essential. And it, if, if I could just show you, it'd be like, you'd be like, oh, click, whew, things are coming bone. You come from Sakai, go back to Sugi, go back to Sakai, come from Canvas, go to Sugi, come from Coursera, go back. You'd be like, yeah, nothing hurt while I was doing that. It was, it was a good user experience. The sequence of things that you see, whether it's an iframe or out of an iframe, is okay. It's so much better than pop up a new window, full different Chrome all the way around. So Sugi tools don't try to put all the Chrome around. What they do is they put up a done button to get back because that actually works in LTI. So part of it is just figuring out what works with LTI and then just doing it, right? And so <laughs> people call me up and they're like, hey, Chuck, I need some mentoring on how to build an LTI tool. tool. And I go, well, how much time you got? And they go like, I got a weekend because we got to do an RFQ on the Monday. And I'm like, just read the documentation because I say to them, I say, do you want to build something elegant? And they're like, oh, I don't have time for building anything elegant. I'm like, okay. Just read the documentation. I'm not going to help you build something not elegant. And they say, well, why don't you just help me about how to do things elegant? I want to do it elegant, but I don't want to use your thing. And I'm like, how about this? You read, read the 20,000 lines of source code that I have figured out how to build an elegant interface. And when you figure it out, then you write it on your code. But don't, I'm not going to explain to you the last 10 years of what I've figured out in LTI to build elegant integrations. But if you want to use my stuff, you just use my stuff, and you get all my elegant integrations. And then if I can convince people that it's so painful to do it yourself, and they all start using my library, boom, consistency. That's why I need a company really fast, because I need to monetize other developers, not so much so that I can get rich, but so that I can monetize people to be motivated to build Sugi tools and make money with Sugi tools. It's not to empower me. I'll do fine, of course, and I'll have plenty of money to give to Perio when it's all said and done, but it's to get it so that people will say, oh, I could do this on my own, or I could do it with Sugi, and it's cool, I can use it on my campus. Oh, wait a sec, I can sell this too by just uploading it? It's like Amazon Create Space, and boom, you're, you're in the business, and you all of a sudden have a clicker thing, and I got all these contracts, well, I got the FERPA figured out, I got the SLAs figured out, I do the hosting, I do everything, you give me a URL to a GitHub repo, and you'll be making money the next day. That will make this work. Any other questions? I think we're out of time. So thank you, thank you for your patience. Um, sorry to the online audience for all of my cursing uh, at the beginning. So uh, uh, cheers, see you on the net.